This is a Galway City Museum podcast. Between November 1922 and May 1923, the Provisional and Free State Governments executed 81 anti-treaty Republicans, which caused great resentment and weakened support for the Irish Free State. On the 20th of January 1923, four Galway men, Martin Burke, Hubert Collins, Stephen Joyce and Michael Walsh, were shot at Athlone Barracks. Here, historian and author Cormac O'Corey discusses the Irish Civil War and executed men. No, and um, you probably have seen them on Facebook and social media or maybe in other areas of the press, uh, the men who were executed, the five men who were executed on the, uh, in Athlone on the 20th of January. Uh, Martin J. Burke, uh, Michael Walsh, Stephen uh, Joyce and Hubert or Herbert Collins, because both of them are used. Uh, I'll be using Hubert, because uh, that's what I'm, uh, I've come across most often, but that's not necessary to say that that's what his friends um, would have called them necessarily. Um, the fifth man was a man from, uh, just on the way into a loan, if you come from the Galway side, uh, Tom Hughes. Um, and um, he also had uh, a connection to the civil war here in the sense that he was arrested down here and he was involved in higher activity in Galway. But I'll come, I'll come uh, to him more. Now, I've seen photographs of, of four of them. I've never seen a photograph of Michael Walsh. Okay? And um, that's quite common when we're dealing with this period. Uh, I've done an awful lot of work. I've met a fair amount of families on, on all sides uh, during this, the revolutionary period. And uh, photographs of people are difficult to, co- um, to come by. Um, obviously, lack of access to cameras is one. But another refrain I often heard uh, was that, um, uh, that the, all the photographs went to America when such and such emigrated. That everybody was said, well, you know, mom and dad are going to be here. You, you know, so we'd we'll be able to look at them. Germain wants to bring the photographs to the States. But that's fine. Okay. Uh, uh, the other thing as well, actually, her, uh, seeing as I raised the issue of photographs, if they have photographs at home, turn them over and write, uh, write in the back of them who's in them. Because in five years' time, in ten years' time, you won't remember. Right? You know, people forget. And that's, that's another craw pre uh, in Irish, another heart skull, is trying to identify, God, the man is the image of somebody else. You couldn't be certain who, uh, who it is. Okay? Uh, now, um, that's me talking as a historian. Um, now, at the same day that these fellows were executed in Athlone, there were further executions in Limerick and in Tralee. And during the month of January uh, 1923, there were 34 uh, uh, Republicans executed by uh, the government uh, and by the, by the army. Uh, it was a kind of a determined effort to try and break the back of um, the Republican resistance, which was, uh, which was running out of steam at that point, but at the same time was able to, still able to threaten government supporters and particularly in areas like Kerry and Mayo, where there was uh, Connemara, where there was still a military threat and a uh, military um, capability as well. Um, we're going to talk about the men themselves. Um, we're going to talk about their, their final few hours, their final letters, and trying to give you some sort of insight into the world that they lived in. Not just the Civil War, but also the kind of North Galway that they grew up in. And things that I think should be considered when we're trying to uh, establish wh- why they felt, you know, th- the way they did, why they took particular uh, p- political paths and that kind of thing. So Frank Aitken, um, the leader of the area, the chief of staff of the area, at the end of the Civil War, after the death of Ian Lynch, uh, wrote in August of 1922 that war with the foreigner brings to the fore all that is best and noblest in a nation, Civil War, all that is mean and base. Now there's a degree of truth, uh, a degree of accuracy, and a degree of inaccuracy in Aitken's statement. Um, it's important to, to remember, uh, all of us, to remember that wars, and particularly civil wars, are, are grey, and the people and the units that are involved, you know, um, none of them are uh, fully black and white. So that people from one side can still look at an individual on the other side um, and have completely different perspectives on an individual's actions. And we'll come to that. Um, now, one of the reasons that the civil war was so bitter was, uh, in the words of Stephen Joyce, one of the men that was executed, he wrote that we meet our debts at the hands of Irishmen. So even now, uh, a century later, uh, that still rankles. There's a kind of there was uh, a lot of bitterness created by uh, the fact that these men were executed by sometimes with guys that had been on the same side of them during the war of independence, and sometimes by people uh, they were seen as being executed by people who had no involvement in the war of independence, but who were brought in to, do, to uh, the Free State Army, the National Army. 
uh, because of their military experience in the British Army and kind of because they would be more ruthless potentially than former colleagues and that kind of thing. Okay, so in um, we go backwards to go forwards anyway. So on the 6th of December 1921, a treaty is agreed uh, in uh, in London, and um, from an Irish perspective, the treaty. Uh, had a lot of good points. Uh, it offered a large degree of freedom, much more than home rule, for example. Sometimes the two things are conflated, and home rule is talked about, which was a parliament with very limited powers in Dublin that the British were willing to concede before the First World War, and it's talked about essentially as if it was freedom. But that, that uh, freedom was very, very limited. So the, the new free state would have, a, have had an awful lot more freedom than, the, uh, than what would previously have been offered by the British. Uh, there was the possibility of incorporating the North at a later point. So there was a boundary commission was to be established, and the attitude of an awful lot of people on both sides of the debate was that, look, we get a, such a big chunk of the North back, we get Fermanagh, that's got a Catholic and nationalist, nationalist majority, Fermanagh's got a, uh, or Tyrone's got a uh, Catholic and nationalist majority, we get those areas back, we get Derry City back, South of Mass, South Down, and the whole place would be too small and too uh, insignificant economically to be able to... Uh, uh, sustain itself and we'll get that back as well. Okay, that was the attitude of an awful lot of them. Another attitude as well was that they just really didn't know how to get the North back. Just n nobody knew, bar a, a massive war, and that had already been ruled out essentially by uh, de Valera previously, that you know, we won't coerce uh, the North. Uh, peace and stability, of course, uh, was a major um, selling point of the treaty. This is that, you know, the black and tans would go, the British army would, you know, would evacuate the barracks, you know, we'd, we'd have the ability to build on um, what we had, but also uh, we'd be able to deal with pressing concerns. And, and one of the things that comes out in the treaty debates in the Dáil, for example, is the question of, for example, the cultural revival. Now we're going to have proper charge of our education system, we can revive and protect the Irish language. Economically, we, we've ha we have the freedom now to try and develop ourselves economically. And bear in mind, at this stage, for the last... Eight, you know, 70 years, the country had been dying on its feet. Like the population had essentially had collapsed, and this was uh, this was one of the one of, I, I think this is one of the driving forces behind the revolutionary period in rural areas. This sense of if we don't do something now in this generation, does Ireland have a future? Okay. Uh, on the other side, the negative aspects of the treaty. Uh, uh, from the perspective, from the point of view of Republicans, and even some of, uh, of those who accepted it had misgivings about some of these issues. The oath um, to, 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 to royalty, to the, to the king, um, the fact that we were still going to be part of an empire that a, a Republican was ideologically opposed to, uh, the previous sacrifices um, uh, that had been, you know, the, the, the men that had died, um, you know, the, the, you know, the people had been tortured. Uh, and you know they died and they, they suffered for a republic, not, not a free state. Uh, there was no guarantee that Britain would respect it. Really, that was another fear that at some point in the future that Britain would again destabilise the country and that kind of thing. And there were people were afraid of that. And also as well, how was the issue of the North going to going to be resolved? Okay. Um, so um, all all these are the kind of debates that. You know, men like the five men that were executed and alone would have been listening to, would have been thinking about, and people went over and back between different different sides for about six months almost between the uh, between the, the, the treaty debates and the uh, the start of the civil war. And again, I'll come to that um, uh, so, um, very uh, very soon. Now, another thing to be uh, con uh, considering when we talk about um, this period is the kind of and the politics and the attitude and the behaviour is the kind of the poisoning of attitudes that occurs during this period. All these tensions that had been sort of, that were manageable during the War of Independence, uh, because Sinn Féin was a very broad church, the Irish Volunteers, the IRA were a very broad church. All these things that uh, come along as well, uh, there would have been an awful lot of, you know, differing opinions, other than the fact that they wanted some degree of independence. All these things start, all these tensions start coming to the fore um, during this kind of half year between the treaty and the start of the Civil War. And, and we, have to, we have to remember that, um, that the attitude of the British Parliament, the attitude of the Crown Forces uh, during the War of Independence, 
helped kind of turn people against <coughs> parliamentary um, you know, politicians, where they're sceptical of their motivations. They, they kind of, they, they, they look themselves as, you know, the, your average IRA man who's in his early 20s looks, looks themselves as the fighting men who, who delivered this, and now the politicians are going to let us tell them they're in it. You know, what, you know, they're in for themselves. The rule of law and the appeal to uh, the rule of law as well, um, and stability. We have to think that the guardians of the, of, of the Crown Forces have shot one of the fellows, uh, the brother of, of, of Hubert Kel uh, Collins. He, they shot him two years previously. Uh, Louis Darcy, uh, um, uh, a, commanding, uh, a senior officer of the, of the IRA in Hertford, um, he was arrested uh, in Oramore and allegedly dragged behind a lorry before he was shot by members of the Crown Forces who were supposed to be the guardians of the forces, of, of the guardians of the law and the legal system. So again, from the Republican perspective and your average IRA man, he, the, these things are, are, their, are you know, kind of are, are to the forefront of their, in their thoughts. They're thinking in terms of, um, well, we have to protect the Republic because we can't rely on others to do so. Uh, and, Louis, and Stephen Joyce, in his uh, last letter, echoed these sort of sentiments talking about Louis Darcy handing him his revolver and told him uh, to lose his life rather than a revolver. And Joyce himself says, this I was determined to do, as you know the consequences now. Okay, so they have the sense of duty to those who die, not just the, not just, uh, got, uh, the men who were executed after 1916, but the guys that they knew and grew up with and knew in their, in their home areas that had met as a course of revolutionary activities. Uh, Hubert Collins talked about uh, dying in 1923, and he, that he died for the same ideal for which he died, referring to his brother Tom. Um, another issue uh, that had poison attitudes in the South towards the new settlement was the suffering of the Catholic minority uh, in the North, the East of the country, particularly in Belfast. Um, and this uh, helped create an atmosphere of instability, or both sides of the, on the treaty uh, debate are kind of going, how do we help these people? Like, what, what, what do we do here? Um, you know, and, you know, and they start, you know, so there's attacks in the north, there is uh, efforts to smuggle arms, um, uh, there's also the seizure of property in the south in some places to help for, to make way for refugees, Catholic refugees from, um, from, um, from, from Belfast and the like. And there's also uh, a degree of cynicism of the northern refugees about, well, why don't you stand your ground? What, what are you doing down here? You know, we can't house our own. And this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, adages are being, um, are being heard. Now, one final thing that angered Republicans was a sense that those who had contributed least to the, to the struggle for independence were now going to see the benefits of this new degree of independence. Um, and not just the occasional IRA officer that hadn't done much fighting, but also people who had been actively, and host, uh, actively hostile to Republican say, for example, were now going to, um, were now going to be trying to uh, take over the new state, that they were, you know, uh, the new state. Um, so they designed, you know, so there's a hardening of attitudes around these sort of issues in that first half of 1922. On the other side, there's a hardening of, uh, of attitudes on the pro-treaty side. So uh, there's um, pro-treaty leaders sneer that what's good enough for Michael Collins is not now good enough for you know, some area that had, that had seen very little fighting during the war of independence. You know? uh, and another, um, so that, that kind of gets thrown constantly in the faces of anti-treaty act, anti activists, uh, not just during the Civil War, but afterwards. Uh, so, for example, Paddy Daly, who's uh, the most prominent and notorious uh, pro-treaty um, or a member of the, the army, uh, the, the National Army, the Free State Army, down in Kerry. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Dublin man. He's one of Collins' men uh, in the squad and uh, intelligence gathering and that kind of thing, carrying out executions, suspected spies and informers and detectives. Uh, and he, he, dis he, he, he told a group of Republican prisoners in Kerry we're the we're, we're the real Republicans, right? So that was his attitude, right? We're 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 with Collins. We're going to work this thing, and we're going to be the guys getting the republic. And you fellas are disrupting that, and you're causing disunity. Um, the the other thing as well to be considered in terms of the hardening of attitudes was threats to social order. You have this is a period where there's not an awful lot of anarchy, so you have criminals and opportunists taking advantage of the kind of the chaos. Um, but there's also a threat to the social order in terms of 
the young, the poor, and women, where the dominant sort of structure that had existed to that point is now under threat, and an awful lot of people feel uh, anxious about the future because of, the, because of this threat to uh, the way the society is ordered. Okay, now I'm going to go back now to the past, the, kind of the, the upbringing that these kind of men would have had. Uh, Hubert Collins, uh, these men grew up in, in a period where uh, the language uh, shift is occurring, but there's also economic shifts occurring in, in East Galway. So there's, there's a massively social change at the minute. And we're inclined to forget when somebody gets a, a plot of land and has a house of their own and that kind of thing. And sometimes the, the historians are kind of fall into the trap of maybe describing these uh, people almost like they're kind of middle class or something because they have a small farm and uh, they're not as poor as a landless labour and that kind of thing. But we're, it's, it's easy to forget how poor an awful lot of these people, uh, people were and the impact that would have had on their lives, living in small houses, uh, you know, struggling to dry, clo uh, dry clothes without, you know, in, in the West of Ireland climate and that kind of thing. Uh, so, for example, so for example, Celia Collins, Hubert Collins' mother, in the 1911 census, she had 15 children uh, born alive, and five of them died. Okay? Now, I've been able to trace three of them, uh, but just when we, when we think of, you know, uh, Thomas and Hubert Collins, you know, kind of this, the, the kind of the baggage that these kind of people would have been carrying from their own lives and their own attitude towards death later on and their own uh, how religious they were and that kind of thing. Um, so um, they also lost another son fighting the British Army in the First World War. And then finally, Thomas is shot in nineteen twenty one, and and Hubert is shot in nineteen twenty three. So the kind of the 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 life of the life of Celia, Celia Collins is very different um, for somebody of you'd say. Like myself, who was born in the seventies, it's almost like it's a different world. Like that kind of that kind of hardship and that kind of pain and suffering. Um, um, so, for example, uh, he had a brother, Michael, uh, who died of whooping cough at eight months, in eighteen eighty eight, before he was born. Uh, another son, I think, I'm not fully certain, uh, uh, died at seven months of convulsions, and another, uh, a daughter, a sister, uh, died uh, at three months of convulsions. And that was just the three that I was able to find. I don't know about the uh, about the others. Uh, there's another thing as well, actually. Is there anybody from um, from that area? From uh, uh, it's uh, if we could get the whole country speaking Irish again, it'd be a lot easier because the, the names uh, uh, I can read a name in Irish, but when you read a name in English of a townland, it can be very, very wrong. Uh, so he's from a place in Irish that was called Quiachail, the Narrow Wood, you know, sticking out into the into the car. Uh, but I've I've three different versions of that uh, from documents and contemporary. And there's an L that keeps ditching uh, or dropping in and out of it. Um, so, Keel uh, Kiel, or Kiel uh, which is the oldest one I could found in, in the 19th century, and then Keel Kill, which was kind of used at the time. So, as I said, this is uh, it. Kind of symbolises uh, the shift uh, that's occur uh, that kind of is occurring at this time. Okay, and I'll come back to that in a second. Okay, All right. Now, um, the. Uh, Things were improving, though, for the likes of the Collinses. Um, in the 1901 census, uh, his father is described as 60 years old, and his mother is described as 42 years old. Um, uh, there was, um, so there's an 18-year gap. In 1911, there was a 22-year gap in the census. Uh, now, that was probably caused by the introduction of the old age pension. Uh, uh, in the meantime, that you had to be over, uh, uh, you had to be over, um, you had to be over seventy to get the pension. Uh, so you, you see this constantly. Uh, you see this constantly all, all over the uh, in, when you're looking at official documents. Now, some of it is, as well as people were kind of vague about the dates of birth. Yeah. I was born about eighteen fifty, you know that kind of thing. And I found one woman in Connemara, and I haven't been able to trace her since. Right? Uh, I found one woman that had, if you do the maths. Uh, she was able to claim the pension in the 1911 census, but, which meant that she had a, a child at the age of 61. <laughs> um, uh, but I've never, I've never been able to find that again. Uh, you, you, you come across the stuff and you can go, oh, I, I, you know, I, I won't forget where I found her. You never do. Uh, and, then, and then the flip side, uh, on a much more somber note, a family down in Clare that I found one time with uh, 11 children born, 11 ch and none still alive, claimed the 1911 census. Right, just... Um, the, the horror of that kind of thing. Now, even now in 2022, right, um, we're talking about that kind of shift that's occurring in, uh, in Ireland at the time. Um, uh, 
if I was to call Oni a walk, you'd know what I meant. Right? Uh, if I uh, if I used the word plucks, how many people would know what I was talking about? Plucks is a big towny sort of slang, which is from good man. Right? Uh, it's uh, pluck up, cheats, uh, uh, an Irish word. Uh, Chine is used constantly. Uh, Bacchity, if a chair is, is, is broken, another Irish word. And, you know, like, you know, any one of you can sit down and probably come up with a couple of hundred of, of these things like, that were still still being used in rural areas. Surnames as well, talking to people out in East Galway. F A H Y, F A H Y. We pronounce Fahi, but I've heard it called Faha, with the, with the Y being dropped. Uh, Jordan, I've heard being called Jordan, uh, much closer to the Irish, and, and, and in, the thing, in terms of Fahi, much closer to the, to the a native Irish speaker dropping the I G H. Um, uh, out in Ockham, uh, talking to talking talk to about Noel Tracy, the T D, not Noel Tracy, right? Uh, and then my favourite, uh, uh, Stanford, uh, S T A N F O R D, being called Stanford, right? Uh, and again, uh, much closer to the Irish would be Stanford. Okay, so again, I like I'll. I'll be kind of clear in a second now why I'm, why I'm bringing this up. These lads were from an area, the four Goa men who were exu, they're from an area where literally within the space of, a, of one generation, a language shift, a massive language shift had occurred. And for me, I think this is something that hasn't really been studied enough in Ireland, right? The impact of it. I mean, we, when people talk about the Irish language, they tend to talk about Gaelic League revivalists, or they tend to talk about... Uh, uh, our speakers almost as if they had no thoughts on this. They just they just got on with it because we needed to go to America and that, that kind of stuff. But for me, in, in this case, there's something very sim- uh, uh, interesting happening. And all these men are for broadly within the same area. And there's something very in- uh, interesting to me. Martin Burke was three years old in the 1901 census. And he was described as being bilingual. Now, at this stage, children were all being raised speaking English in that area, essentially. So that would suggest to me that either that there was grandparents who were very poor English or that one of his parents English at that point was quite poor so there was probably a fair de- de- degree of Irish being so- spoken in the house okay and like he wasn't like he wasn't in school yet and an awful lot of schools didn't teach Irish Hubert Collins in 1901 his fa- uh, it was in an English speaking household Hubert Collins would have been raised speaking, speaking English in 1901 his father is d- described as bilingual in 1911 the census was carried out shortly before his father died, and his father is described as knowing Irish only. Right? So that he was a monolingual Irish speaker. Now, probably for medical reasons, you know, sometimes you know, strokes and the like can happen. I just don't know. Right? Uh, Michael Walsh in 1901, right? At uh, four years old, if you look at the census, what you're supposed to do is if somebody knew Irish only, you're supposed to write Irish. If somebody knew Irish and English, you wrote Irish and English. And if you knew only English, Technically, you're, uh, most people wrote English or whatever, but you're kind of supposed to leave it blank. So Michael Walsh at four years old, when you would have some grasp of the language, <coughs> there's nothing fill in in that, on that box of Michael Walsh suggesting that he's an English speaker. His mother is described uh, with one word, Irish, right? And his father is Irish and English. So again, by 1911, his mother is described as going both language, languages again. So assuming that the census is accurate, okay, um, like there is, uh, it, it must have had, it must have led to these fellas questioning themselves in the world that they grew up in, but also that fear of, oh my God, we're going towards extinction. It must have helped power that. And Stephen Joyce, uh, on the 1901 census, he's seven years old. He's in, he only knows English. His grandmother is in the same house as them, who only knows Irish. How is it that, at, in that and at that time, was so small, he might have been sharing a bed with her. Like, you know? uh, so again, this is something that historians, I think, in my view, really need to sort of you know go after and start you know digging into and finally one major other issue at that period and again these men would have been very very um conscious of it uh was uh the issue of land okay an awful lot of um the ira in the west of ireland would have sympathized with the idea of redistributing land uh, amongst the poorer people to try and maximize the amount of families who could comfortably live, live on the land so there's an awful lot of social upheaval as well at this period. And these men, these four men, would have seen some of that, where there would have been land activity. Now, there was more in South Goa, 
and down around that and right uh, and that area but there was uh, but there was still activity along those lines in the North Galway area that these men would have been coming come from now at this point at the turn of the year 1922-23 um, there's executions but they're in Dublin first the first 12 executions are in Dublin um, other than Erskine Childers who the who the pro treaty side hate because they kind of blame, blame them part of the civil war and the continuation of it, and the men who were executed in the aftermath of Sean Hales being, being shot and then Lee Mellows and three others are spread out. All those men are prominent, so that's five. But the other um, men who were executed, they tend to be very, very ordinary. Uh, and essentially, uh, one captured area I one, one time talking afterwards. Uh, for, about the approaches about the army down in Kerry so if you had a record from the War of Independence they more or less left you alone and they seem to have been trying to avoid martyrs uh, you know very 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 prominent people that, that could attract an awful lot of uh, attention and negative publicity to the state now that didn't always happen but that seems to have been a factor in how they determined um, you know who was, uh, who was to be executed now the men that we're talking about uh, would have been uh, the Goyman there and Hughes. They would have been involved during the War of Independence, but they don't have that kind of profile either you know, at a county level or a national level that they need to avoid uh, executing them. There's then on the 19th of December, there's executions in the Curra. At the end of the month, there's executions in Kilkenny, and as you can see, they're starting to inch out of the way, uh, away from Dublin, and that was part of a very deliberate policy that they were quite open about. Uh, those on the, on the, on the, on, in the government that essentially you needed to provincialise the executions as a way of maximising their impact. There was no point in executing the fellas in Dublin because in Galway or Waterford or Kerry or whatever it just wouldn't have the same impact reading about it in the newspaper. So the 8th of January uh, there's the final executions in Dublin for a while and then there's the Dock, Ross Cray, and as I said on the 20th if Tralee, Limerick and Custom Barracks. Um, so, um, uh, as I said, one of the major reasons was to maximise their impact, but it was also a way, if you provincialise the executions, it's a way of making sure that no commander can say, well, I was against the executions and I wasn't willing to do it. Okay? Um, and with very, very few exceptions, when uh, men were given orders to execute people, they, they, carried, they carried them out. Um, so, at low, the, the, war, the civil war in Galway would have been prosecuted uh, primarily from Limerick and from Athlone. Okay, Limerick towards the south, uh, from the south, uh, as uh, er, very early on in the Civil War, and the Civil War was pretty much over in South Galway within, within weeks. Uh, you got Michael Brennan's command uh, kind of connects Limerick and, 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 and Galway City, and there isn't that much activity, uh, violent activity in, in South Galway uh, afterwards. Uh, Athlone, um, uh, at Lone then is the driving force for much of the Civil War. Now, this command, Macon's command, is heavily criticised for their lack, perceived lack of efficiency and effectiveness in prosecuting the Civil War in, in, uh, in the West. But it's a massive area, and they essentially can't get a hold of Connemara, Mayo, uh, and Sligo. They're just too far removed, uh, and that kind of thing. But it means that the kind of, um, uh, you know, the kind of, you know, uh, Macon's command is under pressure. Now, he's a War of Independence hero. And his area of Longford would have been seen as being an active area. Uh, he's close to Collins. Uh, he's arrested uh, and he's in danger of execution at the time of the truce. Um, so uh, w one of the reasons that Collins was willing to agree with the truce and stick to it and that kind of thing was that uh, McGowan was would have been uh, released and, uh, and and his execution obviously by the British prevented. Um, but this bound Collins and McGowan together. Okay. And if you like, uh, Macron, uh, we, we, should, we just don't know in terms of history, and the what ifs are always dangerous. But he would, let's just say that he would have been, it would have been unusual for a prominent IRA man to, uh, um, to support uh, the treaty. Okay? Um, uh, it's not unheard of, but it's, it's, it is unusual. The Midlands Division that he would have been in charge of was fairly weak in terms militarily during the war, war of independence, other than Longford. And he's also a TD, so he's a, he's a leading figure on the pro treaty side, and they they kind of they give him an awful lot of attention, an awful lot of status. Now, 
One of the things, culture that developed during the war of independence was an attitude that our area is better than your area. Okay, we're doing more than you are, and you're, uh, we're the great fighting men, and you're, 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 you're useless, and that kind of stuff. And there was never any attention paid to things like terrain, lack of weapons, all that kind of stuff. It was like literally, oh, if you want to fight, you'll fight, this kind of thing. Okay, so in April of 1922, uh, there's a standoff in Sligo between pro treaty and anti treaty forces. And Sligo, again, um, uh, you know, kind of unfairly had this reputation of contributing little during the war of, the pen, war of independence, which is unfair and inaccurate. But um, during an argument, Macomb says to Seamus Devins, uh, an anti-treaty TD, he says to him, uh, um, basically, Devins says, if you try and come into our area with, your, with outside troops, uh, there'll be bloodshed. And Macomb said back to him, it'll be the first time Sligo has seen him. Okay, so that you know that kind of you know off the cuff you know remark you know these kind of things create a bitterness. Tom Reddington, the Galway city man who was involved with the IRA in Longford during the War of Independence, um, he wrote a letter to his mother uh, at the start of the Civil War, uh, uh, sneering about the IRA in Galway. And again, Galway uh, had this reputation of contributing very little during the War of Independence. And again, it was exaggerated. And again, it was some of it was just you know for ex other reasons as opposed to accuracy. Uh, but Reddington wrote, wrote, wrote home to his mother. It's interesting to read the names of the prisoners captured from Galway. Some brave and great chaps are right. Pity they didn't think of fighting earlier. Okay, so I'm mentioning those two things just as this sort of this again this hardening of, of attitudes uh, as the civil war goes on. Now Macomb, um, uh, 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 Macomb's um, would say uh, reputation in the civil war was very very mixed, uh, shall we say. Um, 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 obviously the executions angered people for the behaviour of troops under his command and his own behaviour uh, 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 on occasion caused an awful lot of bitterness that lasted long after the Civil War. Um, so I was out, out in the house one time out towards Carla Strand and I was talking to, um, uh, I, I was talking to an old man and he told me, he just kind of sniffed at my bow and he said, he didn't bother canvassing here to, uh, when he was standing for president. Um, and again, it was that kind of the thing that lasted a generation after, afterwards. <coughs> um, uh, his second in command was a fellow called Tony Lawler. Uh, and Lawler wrote home to his mother. He shot a prisoner during trouble in, uh, in the jail in Athlone. And he wrote home to his mother. And it was captured by Republicans. And it was leaked. It was they published it in the press. And one of the lines in it was, it was a wonderful shot. OK? Um, uh, it was McCone's command. It was men under McCone's command. That, uh, shot the, uh, uh, that shot six men up in Ben Bolton as well uh, during, the Civil War, uh, during the Civil War. And that was almost straight away, there was guys under his command who were so disgusted by that that they were, you know, they were quite op op uh, open about what had happened, that these fellows were shot in cold blood. One of them was that, uh, was that TV, Seamus Devins, that McCone and himself had the altercation about in you know, April. Um, but people like Tom McGuire, People like Michael Kilroy, Kilroy and Mayo both felt that Macomb protected them during the Civil War and prevented their execution. So again, like all these figures, there's this, uh, you know, it depends on who, who's talking about uh, these men. Their attitude can be very, very different when they're talking about people on the other side. Now, the, in terms of uh, the war, the Civil War in the West, uh, the IRA during, the, during kind of 1921 and then during the troops as well, uh, the, the, the west of Ireland would have been divided in, by, in the area in terms of four divisional areas. The first western was, was Clare and South Galway, the Dublin Railway Um uh, The second western was East Galway, Trunk of Roscommon, East Mayo. Uh, the third western uh, would have been Sligo, basically, uh, and that was uh, strong. Okay, that was uh, strong for most part of the Civil War. And the fourth Western would have been West Mayo, West Galway, which is strong again during the Civil War. Okay? But the second Western, early on in the conflict, the IRA structure in July of 1922, when the Civil War starts, it collapsed. The IRA structure collapsed. A massive amount of people just resigned. So we're not fighting. And it led, it led to actually guys from the 4th Western Division from Mayo and, and uh, West Galway having to be sent in to, to bolster the IRA in, uh, in East Galway. Okay, so this, that leads to further confusion. To top that all off, some, uh, some guys in uh, the 2nd Western switch sides. So the, the, the whole 
area that these men who are executed uh, are operating in. There's ages, there's just confusion for ages about what, what's going on. And Tom McGuire, who's the officer commanding uh, of the IRA in, uh, in that area, the Second Western East, was from South Mayo, said that he just spent the whole uh, early part of the Civil War like, tramping between different areas trying to find out who was, who, who was with them. And you, it basically, you find out one day, like one, guy, one day you assume that the guy is with you, and the next day you find out he's switched over, he's dropped off, and, and this kind of thing. But another problem they had was, as Tom McGuire uh, later commented, in the beginning, our fellows would not kill the sailors. Couldn't get fellas to fight. Just you know, they just the heart wasn't in it. Okay, there was kind of the regard as nobility in the fighting against the British, but not 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 in the on the uh, not fighting against the free state. And for myself, I think one of the reasons that the men who were executed for, were from this area was that it was it was an area where that it was less likely that reprisals would be taken against pro treaty supporters in the event of executions occurred. Okay, I think the Galway thing feeds into it, that kind of sneering attitude, but also as well, I think that the weakness, uh, the relative weakness of the IRA in, in East Galway, I think, I, I think had an impact. Like, for example, the 4th Western Division, Gerald Barclay was, was captured in October uh, 1922, out in Connemara, and literally the local IRA said, okay, if he's executed, this is a list of fellas uh, of your supporters that we're going to shoot, he's executed. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't executed, and there seems to be much more reluctance to take on, say, the 4th Western Division uh, as a result. Um, however, why Carrie Strand and Hedford, the area of East Galway that saw most activity, was roughly, um, uh, if, you t if, you, if you did a, a rectangle with points and say, Clare Galway, Hedford, Milton, and Chum, that's where the bulk of IRA activity occurs in the Civil War, and then a small group uh, around Ballon Slow. Uh, Tune, for example, is repeatedly raided, even when it's nominally in free state, under a free state and government control, over and over and over again, they just keep raiding it, going in, taking guns off soldiers, taking uh, food out of shops, and that kind of thing. Um, and genuinely, uh, I think that that's probably, uh, that contributes to the, um, the selection of these men. Um, and they're arrested late in 1922, uh, Burke was mentioned that in the Republican press at the time as being connect, uh, uh, connected to um, Glen Maddy, uh, Glen Maddy and arrested Glen Maddy, but I'm not, I'm not sure about the veracity of that. Uh, and he's mentioned in terms of New Year's Eve. But uh, um, Michael Walsh is mentioned in terms of being arrested on the 19th of November at Quaid's, Quaid's Cross. Um, uh, so it's around about that kind of Christmas time period, that kind of uh, period where these, these men are arrested. And they're brought down to a, uh, brought down to a clone. And um, there's very little time, it's hard to establish a time frame, but there's a very, very little time between when they were told to be executed and the executions themselves. Essentially, they had a night, they had hours to prepare themselves. Okay? Uh, Tom McGuire was also sentenced to death uh, as part of that group, but he couldn't explain why, why he was spared and why the others weren't. Uh, but McGuire made a mistake when he was talking later about why he thought he might have been spared. Uh, spare, spare. He was a TD, and there was a, a seemingly a reluctance to execute TDs. And McGuire dismissed that, kind of saying, well, they executed Childers, and they executed Mellows, and they were TDs, and they didn't save them. But both, both Childers and, uh, and Mellows had lost their seats in the, the, the election in June of 1922. So that's probably, uh, possibly, uh, that's what's, what saved them. Now, in the, the, the final um, few minutes here before we open the floor to questions. Um, so... Um, how did they view the sent death sentence? So what was the attitudes of, of these men to their last letters? Um, Martin Burke said, life is sweet. They took it very well. Uh, life is sweet, but we are getting a good chance of preparing for tomorrow. And he says, I'll be singing with the angels when you are reading this. Uh, Hubert Collins, we are all happy uh, going to meet our God. Um, and, and a recurring theme of these final letters was concern for the relatives much more than to serve them from themselves. It's kind of no trace really of bitterness um, uh, or fear or anything. So Tom Hughes wrote to his sister, try and console poor mother and dad. And to his grandmother he wrote, don't fret for me. Uh, Michael Walsh wrote a very, very short letter uh, to his mother uh, and he was very, very direct in his letter. But he said, parents dear, do not be overcome at this for I am quite resigned to my fate. Stephen Joyce told his parents, to trust in the Almighty God that 8 o'clock the following morning will be the happiest hour of my life and that I'd be going straight to heaven. 
And Hubert Collins uh, wrote to his mother, Cheer up, mother dear, you would not be sad if you knew how happy I am. Okay, in terms of the religious belief, but also as well, I'd be seeing my brother Tom uh, in, in heaven. Okay? Um, and it, and um, in these letters, um, we can't be fully certain how strong their own religious belief was. We know what they wrote. Uh, but there was obviously they were definitely writing to console their parents and they were obviously that their religious convictions must have been very very strong if the, if the, uh, you know if that's being written as a matter of comforting them okay but you know um, uh, there's no reason to not, not to assume that their own religious that they didn't also share those religious beliefs okay um, but there was also a concern a real concern for the parents and how their parents would take this so Martin Burke uh, wrote, uh, poor old dad, this will kill him. Okay, and so carrying this kind of fear uh, into the grave with them. Hubert Collins wrote about his mother, uh, for God's sake, try and console her. Do James for me. Okay, knowing that, oh my God, that this, you know, this letter, this letter is going to be tough. And the, the, in, in terms of the worst of, of them, uh, was the mother of Tom Hughes, who was in Athlone, uh, living close to Athlone, and heard the shots, didn't know what had happened. Because uh, he didn't get word until the execution was carried out, uh, so she was—I think she was going into the into the market or something. The next thing she heard firing, she goes, "Geez, what are the soldiers at?" Okay, um, okay. Religion. Uh, Burke, Walsh, and Collins all mentioned a, a priest being with them, and Stephen Joyce seems to be the most effusive in terms of uh, of his writing, but also the most religious. Um, so that, again, re- remember this is a period where there's an awful lot of bitterness between Republicans and. Uh, clergyman and Mellows, for example, had originally refused to see a clergyman at the start, or there was, there was a row uh, between himself and the clergyman. Uh, politically, and in terms of politics and how they viewed themselves, Tom Hughes wrote, I will meet the firing squad just like a soldier should. It is no crime to die in noble cause. So he's not looking at himself as, as somebody who's just you know, kind of destroying the country and you know, has, has no politics and that kind of thing, which again, an awful lot of people dismiss the man's. Stephen Joyce wrote to his mother, um, uh, this has been as a result of your teaching to me. I hope you will not grieve for me. As in, you know, I'm dying for the cause that you, you know, uh, that you taught me. Uh, I'd imagine that she felt uh, had very mixed feelings uh, about being, uh, being told that, uh, probably pride, and there must be some questioning as well. Um, Collins, as I said, talked about dying for the same ideal uh, as Tom Collins, and in a, in a line that probably echoed uh, across letters from the First War and that period. It is great and glorious to die for one's country. Um, uh, on the other side, um, Tom Hughes described um, the soldiers that, are, that were guarding them as as nice as could be. They're only doing what they think is their duty. Um, uh, and this is, um, uh, you know, kind of, um, none of the rest of them talked about that. Um, and there was, uh, again, there was a certain amount of bitterness, uh, in my experience, the people I spoke to about the way in which the executions were, uh, were handled. Um, but obviously that doesn't come out in Tom Hughes' letter. Uh, and also, finally, uh, two things. Their legacy. Uh, how they wanted to be rem- remembered. So Martin Burke wants to be remembered as the wild boy of the family, which is probably, you know, uh, a nice way to be remembered and probably, you know, uh, says an awful lot about him. Um, uh, Stephen Joyce looked to the future and said, I hope that we may be the last to suffer in her cause, as in the cause of Irish freedom, that by our executing the lives of ourselves, that you know, things will move on and the division will end. Uh, and then Hubert Collins was obviously a very practical person and probably shows, again, uh, poverty, but also taking your... your uh, taking. Remember that the IRA re- relied very much on their supporters or people that they could raid for their own equipment and their own, you know... Uh, survival, really. Uh, so, uh, Hu- one of the things that Hubert Collins mentioned in his uh, final letter letters was, "I'm sending a penknife home. It belongs to Miss Rainey." Uh, you know, so he's uh, what he was doing was, you know, dealing with the practicalities and giving out, you know, saying, "Right, give this to such and such, and say hello to, uh, or goodbye to somebody else, and uh, I want you to have this and, and, and this kind of thing." So, the bo- they're executed and their bodies are buried in custom barracks in Athlone. Uh, eventually, uh, the bodies were handed over in October 1924, and again, this created controversy, uh, controversy. So one of the issues was raised was Liam Lynch, the chief of staff of the IRA, he was shot uh, in South Tipperary on the Tipperary Water border, uh, coming to the end of the Civil War. He dies in hospital, and his body is handed over to his relatives. 
On the other hand, guys who are executed in military barracks, their bodies are, are kept indefinitely, and the families want them back. Uh, so eventually, uh, there's a kind of a, enough of an upsurge and kind of criticism of this, even amongst people on the pro treaty side. In October of 1924, uh, the bodies uh, are handed back uh, out of costume barracks, um, including with uh, including um, well, fellows from like um, from who were executed in other areas. Some of them are brought to costume barracks as well. Apparently, um, uh, Michael Walsh's body was the first to be handed over, and then they were done um, piecemeal. But they're they're all brought down to John Patrick then uh, to the cemetery, the Republican plot. Uh, that and then there was, uh, you know, uh, kind of this would have been a, a massive show of solidarity with, with not just the families but also with, uh, with the Republican movement. Um, okay, Shane. Hi. Okay.